Behind the diamond rings, though. I pay attention, I'm listening to your lingo. Who I serve, he got eyes like an ego. He see everything. I promise you won't get away without anything, girl. Yeah. <laughs> But that's a cold heart truth. I'm being honest, don't ever think that you know my mood. He ordered my steps so I know that I will never lose. I'm covered in unseen blood. Like I said, I true. You can't see it, but it's on me. There's something different about the kids, something funny. Maybe if I switch my jersey, they would love me. But what does it matter if he ain't rooting for me? God help me. What the? Yeah, can't do this alone. God help me. You. 
But everybody wants to be put on How you even making all these songs? Like how you get the money, how you get the fame? But why don't you ask what's the cash behind the diamond rings though? I pay attention, I'm listening to your lingo Who I serve, he got eyes like an ego He see everything I promise you won't get away without anything girl. Yeah. <laughs> That's a cold hard truth I'm being honest Don't ever think that you know my mood He ordered my steps So I know that I will never lose I'm covered in unseen blood Like I said, I true You can't see it But it's on me There's something different about the kids Something funny Maybe if I switch my jersey They would love me But what does it matter If he ain't rooting for me God help me What the Yeah Can't do this alone God help me God help me with the yeah can't do this alone God help me
We got volume, we're good. Perfect. So YouTube, if you can hear me, put a thumbs up in the chat. That way we can get started. God bless you all. Hey, Farah, Dr. Solo, Eugenia, Ern, Carl, Eric Goldsmith, Diamond, Sean. What's going on, everybody? How's everybody doing? Do me a favor, Angela. If you could see if you could get, for some reason, the chat is showing up on there, but it's not showing up on there. See if you could get it, like maybe back, uh, minimize it and open it back up. I'm tired. <laughs> I didn't sleep last night praying for everybody. So ready. What's going on, Sean? Sean, we had Eddie Lennox today, so I want you to know we were thinking about you. Straight off Georgia Avenue. While she's getting it up, if you can't get it, I'm, I'll get. I'll, uh, I'll do it from my phone. You can't win them all, so it's okay. While we wait, let's go ahead and knock this out. I tell you what, do it like this. You just put it right here. Then I can read it. Just unplug it all together because it won't stretch that far. Yep. We in here and we're going to behave. Excellent. So let's get started. So tonight we're going to talk about spiritual fathers. And we, you said it's very low? So you could try to give him a chance to fix it. So do this, Jayla. Take my microphone, turn the actual sub fader. And I should give them some more volume on YouTube. YouTube, if you can hear me good, put a thumbs up in the chat. And take the main speaker and turn it down. That way it's not, we don't have to hear me in here. <laughs> Is that better for you, YouTube? If that sounds better for you, put a thumbs up. That way we can get going. I would hate to wait, take away from your precious time, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> much better, much better, much better, much better. Okay. Excellent. So tonight we're going to talk about spiritual fathers. And this is a taboo topic because most people don't understand it. We were having a brief conversation about it yesterday. And I was having a conversation on the train about it. And what I've been graced enough to do is to have actual true spiritual father. What I've also been graced enough to do is to be a father to others. So what I'm going to do is bring the two dynamics together so we can understand what the purpose is, what God desires to do with it, and then how does that fit into the life of every person that hears this. Because what happens we take our natural context of our understanding with our earthly fathers, and a lot of times we try to overlay that on top of what we expect from God, right? Whether that's our disappointments, whether that's our successes, whether that's our failures, or whether that's our uprisings, we take our carnal understanding, our natural understanding, and then we apply that to God. So when God says that if you ask for bread, will I give you a stone, right? If you ask for this, will I give you a serpent? He wasn't saying that I'm better than the fathers of the earth. He was saying, I'm nothing like your fathers of the earth. I'm in a completely different class. That's like, so literally when you go, and we'll probably, we'll probably read that passage. But when you read that passage, it's literally that I am nothing like who you are comparing me to. 
I am at a total separate class as father. So when we first talk about spiritual fathers, the first thing every man has to understand is that he has a spiritual father because God is the father of all what? Spirits. Okay? So if he's the father of all spirits and he's made you spirit, he's your source. So when we talk about father, we aren't specifically talking about gender specific. So most people make it like gender specific. Now, father is a gender term, but when we talk about father, we're talking about the ability from where one can flow from, the source of a thing. So if you're spirit, you're spirit because he's spirit. That means he's your source. If he's your source and he's spirit, but he's your father, you have a spiritual father, right? So most people go, I don't have a spiritual father. Well, first you should look to heaven, <laughs> right? Because you have one. The father of all spirits is your source. Amen? So now that we understand that every man has one, can you put the volume up? Yes, a lot better. Hey, YouTube, I, I'm trying my best. I don't, know, I don't know what to tell you at this point. Like, <laughs> you, you, it may be your device. Maybe, but I'm, I'm not certain. Could you hear it on there? Okay. Y'all hang on one second. So can you guys hear me now? I'm hoping this is better. But before we go any further, it's not going to get any better than this. <laughs> okay? <laughs> so at no point in time for the rest of the evening will it get any better than this. So just kind of bear with us, all right? We had two good nights of sound, so. <laughs> yes, that's much louder. It's great. Perfect. So back to what I was saying, <clears throat> when we start talking about dealing with spiritual fathers, the first thing you have to understand is that in order for any man to even first delve into the realm of spiritual fathers, they first have to be willing to bring themselves under somebody else. So most people actually don't have a spiritual father. Most people think they have a spiritual father until they get told what to do. And then they find out that I'm not a spiritual son, nor a spiritual daughter, nor do I have a spiritual father. The way when we were riding the train today, what did I tell Quentin? I said, listen, a spiritual father is made a father by virtue of a son. I'm a father, but I'm only a father because my son made me a son. My son made me a father. You see what I'm saying? So that's how Paul said to that. I begot you in the gospel. Him bringing Timothy forth is what made him his spiritual father, not that you're just a spiritual father. So spiritual fathers, it's a two-way street. It's a two-way relationship. There is no spiritual father without a son, and there is no son without a spiritual father. The son doesn't exist without the father, but the father's not a father without the son. You understand? And so, <laughs> you sidebar. So in doing that, you have to understand is, Am I willing and able to bring myself under somebody else so they can be a father and so I can be a son, right? So starting, starting with that context, I want us to go to Samuel, and we're going to look at the life of Samuel and Eli. Thank you, Lord. My life has shifted these last two, three days for the good. I'm definitely off do not disturb. Amen. Amen.
So let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1. And I'm going to do the reading just so John can get a break from these last couple of days. Hey, Pat, God bless you. So it says, And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. And it came to pass at that time when Eli was laid down in his place and his eyes began to wax dim that he could not see. And ere the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. And Samuel was laid down to sleep. At that the Lord called Samuel and he said, Here I am. And he ran unto Eli and said, Here I am, for thou callest me. And he said, I called not, lie down again. And he went and lay down. And the Lord called yet again and said, Here I am, for thou didst call me. And he answered, I called not, my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not know the Lord, neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for thou didst call me. And Eli perceived that the Lord had called the child. Therefore Eli said unto Samuel, Go lie down, and it shall be, if he call thee, that thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And the Lord came and stood and called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel answered, Speak, for thy servant heareth. And the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I will do a thing in Israel at which both the ears of everyone that heareth it shall tingle. And that day I will perform against Eli all the things which I have spoken concerning his house. When I begin, I will also make an end. <clears throat> and then you skip over a couple of things. He's talking about he's going to purge the iniquity of Eli's house, so forth, so on. And Samuel lay until the morning and the open as Samuel lay unto the morning and opened the doors of the house of the Lord. And Samuel feared to show Eli the vision. Then Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. And he answered, here I am. And he said, what is the thing that the Lord hath said to thee? I pray thee hide it not from me. God do so to thee and more also if thou hide anything from me of all the things that he said unto me, unto thee, excuse me. And Samuel told him every whit and hid nothing from him. And he said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seemeth him good. <clears throat> And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and did not let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan even to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord appeared again in Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. Amen. Now, that's a long passage of scripture, but I didn't want my man to be suffering because he, he hurting in his vocal cords, putting in that work for the last couple of days. But... When we look at this, you see Samuel is a young man. And what does it say? The first thing it says that Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli. So this is showing you that his relationship and his ministry to God is tied to another man. Most of us would never allow ourselves to be tied to another man in light of our service to God. Because what do we say? I got my own, I got, I have a personal relationship. With, right? <laughs> And it is personal, sort of. However, it's much more than that. It's personal in the sense that it's your service to God. However, your service to God, typically, if you're ever going to do anything great for him, is going to involve other men having their hands in the pot concerning you. Right? So when we look at Eli, it says that he ministered to the Lord before Eli. And then, as he laid down, God called to him. When God calls to him, he doesn't even know it's God's voice. So when we talk about, even when we talk about unlocking the voice of God, I didn't mention this, but in order to unlock his voice truly, you're going to need another man to be there with you because that man can say, okay, this is what God is trying to say to you. This is what God is trying to show you, right? That's like Janique and I, she was talking about a dream. It's like, oh, this, and I just kept snapping up. No, this is what God is trying to communicate. But if you don't have someone to guide you along that process, you could turn your back from God and God is trying to draw you to, just draw you to himself. You see what I'm saying? So Eli is that faculty in the life of Samuel, because what we don't understand about Eli, although he went off the rails in regards to his children and how he should have dealt with them, Eli, when it says that there were the word of the Lord was rare and there were no open visions in that day, Eli wasn't just a priest. 
Eli also functioned as a prophet, right? That's why he could tell Hannah, hey, why are you weeping in this manner in this way? Why are you drunk in the temple, seeing as though it's or towards the temple, seeing as though it's this hour? And then she says, I'm not drunk. I'm just sore and weeping because I'm not without child. She says, okay, be it done for you. And then she returns with child. Only a prophet can give children. That's the only, that's the, apostles can't do it. Pastors can't do it. Teachers can't do it. Van can't do it. That's the great, now others can, God can grace others. So that's not what I'm saying, right? But I'm saying when you see that specific grace functioning, there's typically a prophet that's moving in that dynamic. So when Eli says, oh, it's done for you, go back. She brings back child because of the word of Eli. We see Samuel moving the same grace. That's why it says none of his words would fall to the ground. Now we confuse none of his words falling to the ground as though everything he spoke was what God told him to speak. When it says none of his words fall to the ground, it was everything he spoke by his own choice. Everything he also spoke by his own declaration. You see? So we, we miss it a little, we miss it slightly where none of his words fell to the ground. Kind of. It's none of his words personally fell to the ground. That's why when Eli, excuse me, when Samuel, when God says, I'm done with Saul. I want you to go to David, to Jesse's house, and there they anoint the one whom I've chosen as king. That's why when he saw the other sons and was getting ready to anoint them, God had to stop him. And God said, I do not judge according to the outward appearance, but I judge according to what? The heart. Why? Because if Samuel would have anointed him, God would have backed him up concerning it. And they would have gotten the wrong king. That's why he said, wait a minute. Slow down. So even when it comes to hearing the voice of God, God will expect that he can speak to you in a certain way, yet he ex or he can speak to you in a way that doesn't give you the full instructions. So God told him, go to his house and anoint the one I would chose as king. But God expected him to be able to discern and make the right decision as to which one would be king. So God can speak to you and give you a piece of information, yet he fully expects you to interpret everything that it is he's saying. You see what I'm saying? Does that make sense? God told him what to do, but he didn't give him all of the definitives of who he was looking for. God felt like that's up to you to figure that out, which is why God had to stop him. Before. Stop. Go. He has another. Do you have another son? Well, I have one more. He's out back. But what? He was judging according to what he could see because Saul was tall. Saul was strong. Saul was handsome, valiant beautiful, brilliant. Saul was all these things that David was not. David was a small little runt, yet God was with him. So he looked nothing like what Saul experienced. So he thought, surely this isn't the one. But God doesn't judge according to the outward appearance. He judges according to the heart, right? So even Samuel's getting on the job training. So how much more so for us? Amen. So now he's ministering before the Lord to Eli he goes to lay down, and then he hears his voice being called. Now, when he hears, he hears his father, Eli, calling him. He perceives that, hey, Eli, did you call me? He's like, no, child. Go lay down. I didn't call you. Then he goes again. Did you call me? No. Go lay down. I did not call you. Eli, did you call me? Okay, listen. If you hear that voice again, so he's, he's low-key getting frustrated with him right <laughs> go lay down <laughs> go lay <laughs> right <laughs> hey quentin love you glad you're back home safe so he's low-key frustrated with him and he said okay listen this is what you do when you, i want you to go back if you hear that voice again i want you to say here i am Lord, speak for your servant is listening now, the first thing we need to understand is Eli had the wisdom to know what to tell him to do so now he could begin to interact with God. A spiritual father always has the ability to take you from not interacting with God to interacting with God based upon their understanding of God. So your understanding of God may be this, which is why he thought Sam, which is why he thought Eli was calling him. You see what I'm saying? Now, the dynamic that happens is when you have a spiritual father in your life, what will happen is God will begin to speak things to you and it will sound like you're hearing someone else speak to you, right? Or it will go as even far as that 
that person that's teaching you and that person that's leading you, they'll show up in your dreams. You know what I mean? And then you're like, oh, you don't know how many people tell me, man, you were in my dream last night. You were in my dream. You were in my dream. You were in my dream. That's a common occurrence for me. And what, I mean, what I've told you before, like, it's a number of things. One, God could be speaking to you too. It could be an angel speaking to you. He took my form because he knew you would listen. Right? Which is why you see that happen at times when you see a familiar face in that manner speaking, give you instructions or give you directions of some sort. He knows that that face provides a level of comfort that you would listen to. So they manifest in that way. Amen. So Eli is helping him understand what's going on. And then he begins to interact with God. But without Eli, he would just continue to think what he would just continue to think. Oh, Eli's calling me. He would never begin to understand that God is trying to interact with me. Amen. Now, he's been ministering to the Lord all this time, yet he doesn't know the voice of God. That's the way most of it is. You minister to the Lord, and when you get to a certain point, now God begins to interact with you. Amen? Now I'm going to continue to read to show you some things. Hey, Sean, God bless you. Now, it says in the beginning that there were no open visions, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. And let me see. I'm going to skip down to And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. But then if you skip back up to verse 6, it said that the Lord called him. And then you skip down to 6 again, the Lord called him again. And then when you skip down to 8, it says the Lord called Samuel again the third time. Now it says that he called Samuel. Therefore said Eli said to Samuel, go lie down. And it shall be if he called thee, that thou shalt say, speak, Lord, for thy servant here. And the Lord came and stood and called as at other times. Man, I, he called to him again, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, speak, your servant is listening. And then God begins to tell him this is what he's going to do, so forth and so on. And if you go down to verse 15, that's what I'm looking for. He said that God spoke, God spoke, God spoke, God spoke. By the time we get down to verse 15, listen to this. And Samuel lay unto the morning. And opened the doors of the house of the Lord. And Samuel feared to show Eli the vision. But it says that he was speaking to him and he was calling to him. But by the morning time, he says, Samuel was afraid to show him the vision. So was he calling to him or was he speaking to him? Was he showing him a vision or was he calling to him? You see what I'm saying? Even in understanding how God speaks. Remember I told you, God will show you a thing and then that determines what you hear. You will hear a thing and that determines what you see. Amen. Then Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son, he said, here I am. What is the thing I pray thee hide it not from me and more so? And Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. So Samuel literally is now stepping into visions of God. He's increasing in his insight and his revelation and his interaction with God. But he doesn't even begin to step into vision. Remember it says that there were no open visions in that day and the word of the Lord was rare. It wasn't until another man told him, Go and wait for God in this manner, in this way. And then all of a sudden, Samuel begins to see. But if Samuel doesn't have Eli tell him, you need to go wait on God, he never gets the opportunity to see. That's what it's like being under spiritual fathers, being under spiritual doctrine. They give you things and they teach you things in such a way that now you have a tool and a key to when God comes to meet with you, you can now meet him on the other side. You understand? You can literally... Meet him on the other side because now you have the key of, okay, this is what I do. Okay, this is what I say. Okay, this is how I position myself. Okay, this is how I prep my heart. This is how I prep my vessel. All those different things. So spiritual fathers are the utmost importance. And then you look at Samuel and Eli, you see the same thing transition to Samuel and Saul. Saul is a man who can't hear from God. Saul is a man who has no vision. Saul is a man who has no insight in that way. That's why when they lost their goats, they said, let us go up into the seer for surely he will be able to tell us where our goats are, right? They go into the seer. However, when he's done with Samuel, all of a sudden this man can prophesy, this man can dream, this man can have visions, this man has wisdom, how to guide people. He was deep. But prior to that, he had none of that. He couldn't dream, he couldn't see visions, he couldn't prophesy. But his connection to another man all of a sudden shifted who he was. Kind of like the two men in the camp we spoke about last night, right? 
They came in contact with another man's spirit. They came in contact with another man's grace. They came in contact with another man's atmosphere, and that shifted it for them. You see what I'm saying? So we see that with Samuel and Saul also. But the moment Saul moved into dishonor from honor, all of a sudden, everything God gave him, he withdrew. So this means that spiritual fathers have the ability to give you access into deeper realms with God, but they also have the ability to withdraw your access into deeper realms with God. Literally. Samuel cut him off from that. So he says that he sought by the prophets, and he said the prophets would not answer me. He sought the Lord by Urim, that wouldn't answer him. He even tried to dream a dream. Now, when it says that he tried to dream a dream, having a dream is one thing. It's like when you lay down and you have a dream, that's one thing. Somebody dreaming a dream, that's, pro that's a prophet's thing. You see? The ability to dream a dream is a prophet's thing. The ability to be within visions in a dream is a prophet's thing. The ability to see visions within a dream, all of that is prophet's doctrine. Samuel knew how to, excuse me, Saul knew how to do it. Say he tried to dream dreams and he couldn't even do it. Literally, the prophets cut him off. All of his, his access point was based upon another man. The moment he dishonored that man, that access got cut off. You see that? So our relationships aren't tied to ourselves as much as we like to think. Literally, the moment he dishonors, that access point is cut off. And that's why it's important understanding honor amongst the dynamic of spiritual fathers. And what happens is it gives you access beyond what you would have on your own. If this is your capacity, now your spiritual father capacity is this. This was your ceiling at one point, but now this becomes your floor. And now you get to go higher. So literally, this was Saul's capacity. However, when he connected with Samuel, all of a sudden this became his floor. The moment he dishonored him, he had nothing. Right? That's why honors are the most important. Honor, is, if, you know, if you don't get nothing else, honor is of the utmost importance. I didn't say if they're right, <laughs> right? Because even Eli was wrong when he judged Hannah. But it didn't change the fact that Eli still had the ability to give her a son, right? She could have dishonored him, but she chose not to. And she got what she was looking for from God. So now you look at those dynamics. Every man, if he's going to do something great for God, is going to need another man in his life. So I tell, I tell you like this, no man will ever have a spiritual father if he doesn't have a great destiny from God. There's no need. God invests that into your life because this is your floor and he needs this to now be your ceiling. But you never reach that unless you have something great to do for God, there's no need. Right? And I believe every man has something great to do for God. He just has to be willing to put his hands to the plow. So when you look at even with Elijah and Elisha, you got the whole entire school of the prophets. Yet, here's another man out here plowing with his yoke of oxen, and he receives deep grace all because God decided to bring another man alongside him. Hey, I want you to go choose Elisha and anoint him to be the next prophet. But if he dishonors Elisha, if he doesn't stay connected with Elijah, if he doesn't understand how to function with Elisha, he doesn't receive grace. Right? And then... He, we all know it, he goes on to receive a double portion of his spirit, right? That's what it says, like, hey, he receives a double portion of his spirit. And even Elijah told him, this thing that you're asking, this is a hard thing. This is a hard thing that you're asking for. But this is the same man who caused the heavens to be stopped up. This is the same man who slayed the prophets of Baal. This is the same man who called fire down from heaven to consume the sacrifice on the altar. And he all of a sudden says, I know, I, I know all these things took place. However, you wanting a double portion of my spirit, this is a hard thing. So understanding how to receive the spirit of a man isn't just as easy as just, oh, yeah, you just whatever, and, I, and you just get it. Elijah told us this is a hard thing. This is a hard thing. The same man who stopped the heavens, the same man who did all these wonderful feats said, you receiving my spirit is a very hard thing. You understand? So now, even in that, when we look at Elijah and Elisha, Elisha then goes on to receive that very double portion of his spirit. But when he receives that double portion of his spirit, it's upon his connection to his father. So when he goes up, even, even the school of prophets, they all understand. Don't you know your master's going to be taken from you today? Don't you know today your master's going to be taken? So 
they were great that they knew information, but they didn't know how to function with God. You see the difference? So they knew information. We're living in information age. Everybody knows, everybody knows everything. Everybody's on the same level now. Not really, but everybody knows everything in the sense of the information age. But do you know how to function with God? Right? That's the question. Do you know how to function with God? Can you get an answer from him? Can you get an answer on behalf of someone else? Can you get an answer on behalf of a certain thing? And that requires right standing not only with God, but with the men God puts in your life also. You understand? So Elisha receives that double portion of his spirit. When Elisha gets taken up in the whirlwind and that mantle falls back down, Elisha grabs it and he knows what to do with it. If the other prophets grab that mantle and they strike the water, I'm telling you nothing happens. Because you have to be connected to the God of your father. But you're connected to him by your father. That's why he said, my father, my father. As the church saying when he says, where is the God of my father? Not where is my God. Where is the God of my father? So if you don't have a reference point for what God has done in another man's life, you can't call up God has done in his life. They had crossed that Jordan many times in that same manner. They, we think it like it was just one time. That was his normal way of going across. Bop. Well, Bop, let me go back. Bop. That was his normal passage way of getting across. Elijah said, I'm not walking around. That's how we're gonna do this. Boom. <laughs> that literally that was his no, that was his normal passageway. That was one of the ways that he would get access to the other side. Now, Elisha understands because he's been walking that same path with him. Walking that same path with him. As he's walking that same path, he could have said, Okay, I seen him do this before. Let me do this. Right? However, he says, where is the God of my father? Why? God, you're obligated to me based upon who I'm connected to. You understand? Father, you're obligated to me based upon whom I'm connected to. God has an obligation because God's a God of covenant. So God will answer prayers that you pray based upon who you honor, who you're connected to, sometimes quicker than he'll answer your own prayer. It's the same prayer, but sometimes he'll answer it quicker and ask for it more efficiently and more excellently based upon whom you're connected to. We see that with Ishmael. When they send Ishmael off, when they say, hey, listen, just go ahead and send Ishmael off. I know this is a hard thing. I'm going to be with him. I'm going to make him a great nation, so forth and so on. When a young lad is crying, God then speaks through the angel and says, we heard the young lad crying. They didn't answer the mother crying. They answered the young lad crying because he was connected to his father. God's promise was based upon the young lad, and I'm going to make him great. Although I'm sending him away, I have a plan for him based upon him being connected to you. So, you know, I kind of hit on him being the only son, and nothing counts if you do it in your own strength. Yet God still thought in the midst of that, I'm connected to him by who you are, Abraham. Don't worry about him. I'm going to take care of him. Even when she ran away the first time, when, when she couldn't take she couldn't take her railing. She couldn't take her coming against her when she ran away the first time. God preserved him then. Why? The young lad has Abraham's blood running through him. You see that? So now you better understand that Jesus, we have his blood running through us, which what? The father will hear us because of him. You understand what I'm saying? Literally, it's not upon your own work, but because who you're connected to, whose blood is running through you, causes God to look upon you and say, you know what, let me fix this for them. Let me, let me course correct this for them. So good, man. Amen. So let me fix this. Let me course correct this. Let me move them about in this way, in this manner. And now when we go back to Elijah and Elisha, Elisha understands different dynamics that the rest of the prophets don't understand. The school of the prophets, although they're with him, they don't understand how to function with miracles. The school of the prophets don't understand power. The school of the prophets don't understand certain dynamics about prayer. These were things that he learned in secret. You see? So a lot of us, I, I would challenge you, most times people make spiritual fathers their church relationships. Spiritual fathers are a life relationship. Because there's things that, you, and you know there's things that I say when we cut a microphone that I would never say openly. 
Why? Because spiritual fathers are a life relationship, not a church religious relationship. Spiritual fathers aren't a church organization relationship. Elisha and Elijah didn't have a church organization relationship. Elijah and the school of prophets had a church organization relationship. That's why they didn't know what he knew. But Elisha had a life on life relationship. That's why Elijah understood how to part the waters. And then when you look at Elijah, Elisha did double the miracles with double the power, right? Elisha understood how to purify the stew when it was sick, when it was bad. Elisha understood how to get an ax head to come up out of the water. Any one of the school of prophets had no clue. That's why they had to call for him. Oh, our master, my ax head is floating and I borrowed the money for this. Oh, just take the stick and drop it in the water. Boom. Where did he learn that from? Who taught him that? Because the school of prophets didn't have a clue. If they had a clue, they said, oh, man, remember we learned this. This is how you do this. Church relationships will always limit you in what you know. Life relationships will bring you into the secret things of God. Right? That's what it says. The secret things of the Lord our God belong to us and to our children that we may serve him. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things that he reveals belong unto us and to our children forever that we may fulfill all the works of his law. So literally, there are secret things and they belong to God is what Deuteronomy said. That's what Moses said. There are secret things that belong to him, but when he reveals them, they now belong to me. When they belong to me, they also belong to my children forever. So the things that I teach my son, they will never leave the earth. They will continue from generation to generation to generation to generation to generation. Yet there will be a bunch of other church relationships that have no clue how to do certain things. You see what I'm saying? You had an entire school of prophets which represent church relationships. Yet you got one man who understands how to move in miracles. You got one man who understands how to deal with a famine. You got one man who understands how to give life to somebody. What did Elisha say? Oh, man, you want a child? Tell her it's done. Tell her it's done. He, he didn't even, he passed the word. Oh, tell her it's done. The school of prophets can't do that. Remember I told you life giving is a prophet thing. That's why Eli was able to do it. Oh, yeah, that's done. Tell her it's, you got it. That's done for. So the secrets are with the fathers. However, if you make a spiritual father relationship a church relationship, all you will have is a church relationship. You'll pack chairs or you'll do whatever, whatever, whatever the case may be. Would you say, armor bearer? <laughs> yeah. You know, of all the years with my spiritual father, I've never carried his Bible once. You know what he'd always say? I, mean, I, I can carry my own Bible. Right? I can carry my own Bible. So I learned in a different manner. We don't have a church relationship. We have a life relationship. Now the dynamic is every secret thing that I've learned never happened in a church context. It would happen while we were building his coffee shop. It would happen while we were building his massage parlor. It would happen while we we're doing other business affairs or whatever. And you go, you know what all the church relationships were? Nowhere to be found. <laughs> when the good stuff come out, you know where they are? At church. But four in the morning when we put in concrete floors in, it's just us half delirious. And then all of a sudden you get the gold. You see what I'm saying? Elisha learned the secrets because he being connected to his father beyond just a religious jargon, church relationship. And so then the thing is what happens, we get tempted to think that how do I press this relationship about my own accord? How do I force this thing about or how do, I, how do I bring this thing about at my own strength and at my own will? And the key is that it's never at your own strength. My son didn't ask to be born. I, he was given. Spiritual fathers are a lot like in the same way. And the dynamic is, do you have the wisdom and the sight to see far enough when Elisha walks by and throws his mantle on you and says, come follow me? Most people don't have enough sight for that. They'll say, man, I don't know, man. Let me pray about it. Let me pray about it. Let me, let me fast a little bit. <laughs> let me think about it. Let me, let me check with my parents, right? Let me, all these, di all these different, all these different, let me bury my father, right? He said, hey, man, well, the, the dead have the dead. And let me take care of this. Let me settle this. 
And you see, even with Elisha, Elisha got paid double. Elisha said, hey, man, you owe me double. I left my father's house. I left my inheritance. I left this. Give me a double portion of the spirit. That's how you can make this right. Remember, in order to receive inheritance, you have to set your you have to settle the affairs of your father. If you don't settle the affairs of your father, you don't receive that. We say, man, let the dead bury the dead. You come with me. Why? Because what I can give you is much greater. That's why Jesus would then go on to tell them, when the young rich ruler came, he says, It's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom. And they said, Well, who could be saved? Because that means they had money. And then he turned to them, he says, No, after the young rich ruler walks away. He turns and tells them what he doesn't tell everybody else. There's no man who has a left father, mother, sister, brother, businesses, so forth, that won't receive in this life a hundredfold and in the life to come. Right? No man that won't receive in this life and in the life to come. Elisha got a double portion in this life and in the life that to come. What he walked away from, he received in that life. And Elisha went on to do double, greater, all of those different things. But all of that was tied up inside of another man. You see that? All that was locked up inside another man. If that other man doesn't release that unto him, you don't have anything. And that's the thing, though. He served under the hands of the prophet. Most people aren't willing to do that. Even when it talks about the young prophet, it says that the sons of Hemathan, Jedathan, and I can't remember the other one, but it talks about how they prophesied under the hands of their father. What I mean, they prophesied under his watch. They prophesied under his direction. They prophesied under his care. They prophesied under his tutelage. Most of us want to prophesy outside of anybody's care, outside of anybody's tutelage, outside of anybody's direction because we hear from God. But he prophesied, they, those sons prophesied under the hands of their fathers. Even the one that talks about the musicians, how they prophesied according to the instruments uh, up under their fathers. When talking about Asaph and all those guys, they were prophesying on the instruments up under somebody else. So one of the dynamics is if you're ever going to move into that, you have to be willing to bring yourself up under somebody else. But the problem is our generation has made us so independent because what we're strong and because we're strong, we can never be willing to yield our strength. It doesn't matter how beautiful the horse is. If it's not willing to submit, nobody's going to ride it. And as long as you're a wild horse, you eventually die. Right? Wild horses only last in, in the Bahamas and places like that. Like, they're, they're unicorns in a sense. But as long as you're unbroken, you're unfit for the master's use. As long as you're unwilling to be bridled and to be ridden, you're unfit for the master's use. So they prophesied under the hands of their father. That's what you have to ask yourself. Am I willing to do what God has called me to do under the hands of somebody else? Am I willing to do what God gave me to do under the hands of somebody else? And most people, if they're honest with themselves, they're not. Most people, if they're honest with themselves, they're not. They like to think they are, but they're not. But God interacts with us based upon those who have interacted with him before us. That's what most people don't realize. He interacts with us based upon what other people have experienced. That's why he would go on to say, the God of your fathers, not the God of you. <laughs> he said, the God of your fathers. Pride won't allow a man to make himself small under the work of another man. Yes, that's right. I'm processing, I'm processing this deeply. Amen. Life relationships. Yes. I was just catching up on some of y'all stuff because it's, it's so small on here. But that's the dynamic. Are you willing to bring yourself under another man's work in that way? Well, God gave me this to do, right? Well, God thought he would put the most choicest things in men, and in order for you to get them, you got to bring yourself under them. You understand? So that's why he's generation and how he's dealing with people. The God of your fathers. That's why he would be the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Right? Even going so forth, even unto Joseph. It was continual. God was generational how he was dealing with them. But most of us, we're not willing to deal with God in a generational way. And because we're not willing to deal with him in a generational way, we end up dealing with God on the surface. But God wants to bring you into the deep. But you never know how to cross over to that because 
you haven't sat with someone who's willing to tell you, hey, when this happens, do this. Okay, if you ever face that again, this is how you can fix that. Or what happened, when this happens, you can do this. Those secret things that God gives them, you're now limited. You understand? That makes sense? That's what Paul was going to say that you have many teachers. What is that, Corinthians? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I believe it's in Corinthians. <laughs> <laughs> you can believe you can believe me. Let me see that one. Sean is in it. Sean, put put the description in the chat for me, Sean, that you have many teachers and few fathers. Put it for me in the chat so they can have it. But I'm gonna get it while you don't while you living in the virus. Many teachers. When John and I read it. Mm -hmm. Hold on a second, guys. I'm pulling it up for you. Yeah, so that's, that's the news in Corinthians. That's 1 Corinthians 4 and teaching, 4 and 15. For even if you were to have 10,000 teachers to guide you in Christ, yet you would not have many fathers who led you to Christ and assumed responsibility for you. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the good news of salvation. So Paul tells us that you have many teachers, but there's very few fathers because a father assumes responsibility for an individual. So even in that, right, when people say, oh, that's my spiritual father. If that person doesn't have responsibility for you, that person is not your spiritual father. You just have a religious relationship. If that person doesn't have responsibility for you, that's not a spiritual father. They may be a church father. So you don't, what happens is we confuse the two. Paul was a spiritual father to Timothy, but he was a church father to the Corinthian church. You see the difference? He was a spiritual father to Timothy. He had responsibility for him. I am responsible for you, but he was a father to the church. When you look at Onesimus, Onesimus was a slave. Paul had personal responsibility for Onesimus, but he had a church obligation to the Corinthian church. Those are two different dynamics. Church fathers, spiritual fathers, two different things. That's why I said that you have many teachers, but you have few fathers. You understand? So that's why I said it's not a religious relationship. It's not a religious relationship. Jesus exemplified that when he dealt with Peter. It wasn't a church relationship. It was a life relationship. When Peter gets down bad, Jesus shows him how to pay his taxes. He's like, hey, all right, this is what you do. You're going to go down to the fish. You go down to the water, you're going to find this fish. When you get this fish, it's going to have this much. It's going to be enough for me and you. I ain't even had to go in my pocket either. This is how we're going to solve this. <laughs> right? Hey, we're going to take, go ahead, go ahead, take care of mine too. Why? A father will always assume responsibility for those who belong to him. Jesus is not a deadbeat. And if someone says they're your spiritual father and they don't assume responsibility for you, I'm telling you they're a deadbeat. So you can't be willing to just take that label and apply it to people. And what I found is that we so willingly apply that label because all the suffering we had in our own lives, whether that was rejection from our fathers, whether that was let down from people, at our mothers, whoever's supposed to be with us, whatever, we take that rejection, that trauma, that hurt, that pain, and then we bring it over into the kingdom. We say, you're my spiritual daddy. Right? But that person's not willing to assume responsibility for your soul's salvation either. Paul said, I begot you, I labored again that Christ could be formed in you. I mean, I took responsibility that Christ would be shaped in you. I took it again. A sec that's what he said. It took me a second time to labor that Christ could be formed inside of you, that I could bring you forth. If a person's not willing to take responsibility to shape and labor to bring you forth in Christ, that's not a spiritual father. You understand? And I'm just debunking kind of some of the, those, that religious mindset and the traumas that life brings because life's traumas will literally have you take those traumas and then apply them to your walk with God. So you suffer trauma at the hands of a father or a mother and now you bring that over into the kingdom when God really wants you to fix your heart so that you can have a clean slate to walk with him. Remember, he's not like the fathers of the world. He's not like the fathers of the earth. He's in a class all by himself. You understand? 
So then what happens is people try to debunk that. And they say, well, you know, what is it? The word of God says, don't call no man father. Right? That's what it says, right? Jesus said, don't call no man father. I'm like, well, genius, you have a dad. And you call him father. <laughs> so clearly that isn't the extent of what he was saying. All right, let me find that so we can read it. Yeah. It's so small here. I, I'm so prone not to look at it because I'm so used to looking at the TV. Um, I'm so happy. Hold on. I'm so happy I'm learning about this because the church taught me nothing. <laughs> Golly. Golly. Where's the shoe? Yes. Life relationship, church relationship. Uh, but is it still possible to have more than one spiritual father? It is possible. It is possible. However, most people assume that, but they don't even have one true spiritual father relationship. Like, do you have one true spiritual father first? Like, let's start there. Right? So I'm not, Claudius, I'm not discounting you. I'm just speaking in general. Most people don't have the first spiritual father relationship down. He says you have many teachers, few fathers. I do believe it's very possible to have more than one spiritual, more than one spiritual father. I personally don't, right? Because I just don't. <laughs> like, my son has one father. Why? Because life has gone well in a way where he hasn't had to suffer trauma. Typically, if he ever has to have another father, some trauma of some sort has entered into his life. Some deficiency of some sort has entered into his life. Somewhere down the line, something wrong has happened. So even when a person says, I got three spiritual fathers, something wrong has probably happened. Something wrong. If my son were to say, man, you know, my dad, my stepdad, and then my step-stepdad, we would all of a sudden sound, that sounds weird. Right? And then, but we take that and apply it to the church, and it's not. I think what you're trying to say, is it possible that I can receive from different sources? And that is the case, more so yes, than that you have multiple spiritual fathers. Claudius, I hope that helps. That's more so the case that you could have more individuals that pour into you and that aid into your service. So for me, that's one of the things God did for me. He brought some of the best men and women to God, some of the most choice. And the only reason I don't name drop is because I'm never a fan of people name drop because then it can bring them clout, right? Like, so if I start dropping names, then they'd be like, oh man, they want to associate with me based upon the name I dropped. And I don't like that either. Like, and don't drop, I wouldn't drop the name to make, to give me more credibility. So I just kind of, I exist, I exist where I exist. However, God took some of the most choice people that everybody knows and invested them into me. And none of them feel the need to think that they're my spiritual father. Yeah. They all know I have a spiritual father and they all gave me things that my spiritual father couldn't give me. And at no point in time did they feel like, oh, I'm his, oh, come here, son. And then to try to son me and all that kind of stuff, right? Because that's, that, that's kind of why, the way it happens, right? What happens is all of a sudden you have value and they want to bring that up under them because that brings them credibility also. But my spiritual father was there when I was nothing. Right? Why? Because he assumed responsibility for me. So, Claudius, the real question would be, do you have two individuals that are assuming responsibility for you? Rather than is it possible to have two spiritual fathers? Do you have two people that are assuming responsibility for you? And then what do you do when both of them disagree? Who are you going to honor then? Because remember, honor was what brings you everything inside of them. The moment you dishonor one, you cut yourself off from that one. So what are you going to do then? I'm challenging the idea and the concept of this religious stuff that we make up. Hold on, hold on one second. I'm, I'm gonna come at it. I'm gonna catch this question, Don. I said, "How does the entire transaction present itself? Does the child come to the father, or the father come to the child, or both? Because I just personally claimed you. <laughs> That's not the way it worked, Diamond. I came and found you. You think you claim me? I came and I found you. What did I say that night? I said, "Hey, I need to go find her." 
before she knew who I was. I said, hey, I need to go find her. And I went scouring the internet looking for a diamond. And I couldn't, it took me weeks to find her. And then you reached out to me and said, God put it in my heart to reach out. No, you think you found me. I found you. That's the way it was with God. We think we found him. Oh, I found God. No, he found you. So you can rest assured that you didn't just claim me. God put it in my heart to find you. I don't have a spiritual father, but you have a big brother. And a big brother, the function of a big brother who leads the family becomes your father. So one of the things I knew in my life is that I would serve as a big brother to a lot of people. However, in me serving as a big brother, God would invest things in me that none of the family has. And when the father dies, the big brother becomes the father. Joseph was the father Although he was the little brother, Joseph wasn't truly the little brother. Joseph was the father. You understand? So there's many people that just understand, oh, that's my big brother, that's my big brother. They, they understand what they're truly saying. I hope that helps you, Sean. So I lived with my spiritual father for years, and he went to be with the Lord. However, the Lord brought me someone else into my life. That's actually, that's actually absolutely perfect. So my wife and I, our spiritual mother went on to be with the Lord very shortly into my walk with God. And God brought me someone else. She went on, it was one of the worst things you ever want to experience. She went, went, home, went home to be with the Lord. You never want to experience that. However, God was faithful. My spiritual father, his spiritual father went on to be with the Lord. And God brought his spiritual mother to him also. So God is faithful in that way. He will not leave us as orphans is what the scripture says. He will not leave us as orphans. He places that adoption in our hearts so we're accepted by him and others. So Claudius, I hope that helps you. How do you know you got the right spiritual father? Well, you better just hope. <laughs> right? But in all seriousness, Elisha had enough insight to understand I'm going to follow this man. Peter had enough insight to know, I'm going to follow this man. James, John, Nathaniel knew, I'm going to follow this man. You have to have eyes to see who it is who's telling you to come and follow them. You have to have eyes to see. So you ask God, Father, give me eyes to see that I may know which direction you would have me to go. God won't lead you astray. God's not interested in sending any of his children on a dummy mission or sending any of his children on an orphan's mission. God's not interested in setting you up in any trauma to be rejected. You understand what I'm saying? That's not the way he operates and that's not the way he moves. I had a spiritual mother when I, when I first got saved. She was 92. That's a blessing. I just asked my wife, did she think that was the case? We, refl we reflected and agree she was. Thank you for this. Hey Amen. God bless you. And Diamond said, yeah, you're right, you're right. <laughs> Hmm? Oh, yeah, what was your question? I'm sorry. I was... The, your, I've, I yeah, go ahead. You're good. Is it possible that a person can claim possibility of seeing and then not be really a spiritual father? It's possible. However, they now have the burden and obligation that they need to get you everything you need to get you where God has you to go. If a person wants to claim responsibility for you, they better much very well be ready to get you where God has you to go, right? That's why you don't see me hanging out trying to raise up no pastors. Ain't nothing I can do to help them. Unless they just want to be a super prophetic, super spiritual pastor. I ain't got nothing for them. You see what I'm saying? There's nothing I can do for them. So I would never assume responsibility for the one I can't help. And you better have enough insight to know where God is sending this person. Most people don't. So the modern discipleship making movement is come follow me. However, if you don't have anything to offer that person, it's best that you win them and send them to somebody that they can follow who can help them. That's difficult because we make it about drawing people to ourselves. How many can I get? Which is, I get it. We, we're numbers people. Like We want to just, I get it. You want that stamp of like, I did it. However, you need enough insight to know what is God doing in this person's life? 
Where is God sending this person? Diamond, I can get her where she's going. Why? Because I have grace for certain types of people. People with certain calls, I have certain grace for. People without those, I don't have grace for it. So I could just give them good information, but good information doesn't propel you. It doesn't give you the spiritual backing to propel you and push you into what God has for you. What do I always say? Let your words be seasoned with grace. Grace is the backing force and the backing power that brings you into what God has for you. If you don't have the grace for that person, you should probably hand them off. There's plenty of people that I want them, like, you know what, you're going to be perfect with this pastor right here. You know, people I talk to, hey, man, we need to find you a good local church. We need to find you a good Bible-believing pastor. Why? That's what's going to cause them to thrive. That's what's going to cause them to be everything God wants them to be. And there's plenty of others where I say, hey, man, you need to leave that church now. Unless you want to die and not fulfill what God has for you to do. You see? So it's never cookie cutter is what I'm saying. But if you are willing to take responsibility for someone, you better have everything inside of you to get them where they're going. If you don't have it inside of you, don't assume responsibility for them. You know what I mean? And not you personally. I'm saying the idea in general. If you don't have it inside of you to get that person where they're going, don't assume responsibility for them. When you look at the fathers, every time they bless their children, they bless them with everything inside of them to receive what they needed to go on and serve God. So when it talks about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, if you look at every blessing that every one of them received, it wasn't just monetary blessings. When you look at how Moses blessed them, it wasn't just monetary blessings. They had the ability to take some from out of themselves and put it into them. If you don't have the ability to pull from out of yourself and give it to someone, don't, don't get involved in that. What Pastor Jeff said, I'll give the rest of my life to them. Right. If you ain't got the ability to be like Pastor Jim, just let it be. <laughs> and the father has to know God. That's the key. Do you know God? The father has to know the one who was from the beginning. If that one doesn't know the one from the beginning... There's, no, there's nothing they can help you with. That's what John said in 1 John. I write to you fathers who have known him who was from the beginning. Remember he told him in 1 John, I write to you little children. I write to you young men. And I write to you fathers. He subsetted the book to different types of groups of people to talk to. But every time he spoke to the fathers, I write to you mature fathers who have known the one who was from the beginning. If you don't know the one who was from the beginning, you ain't got no business trying to help people in that way. Go and get them paired up with somebody who's known the Father from the beginning. You understand what I'm saying? Because the one who's known the Father from the beginning has the ability to draw from out of his self and give to you. You can't take nobody where you've never been. Right? That's why you never hear me trying to talk pastor stuff, evangelist stuff, apostle stuff. You don't hear me trying to do that. Why? I can't take them where I've never been. I can just get them an idea. I think you go down the street and you're going to try to turn left and then go around here look... I can't help them. But the one who's, I know where they're going, I can give them the roadmap. This is what you're going to look here. Watch out for this turn. So forth and so on. Right? Jesus says, I go to prepare, oh, I go to prepare a place for you. I go to pre prepare, I go to prepare a place for you. That way I can bring you to where I am. I'm going to prepare a place for you so I can bring you where I am. If you don't have the grace to bring somebody where you are or to bring them where you're going, that's not a true spiritual father relationship. You understand what I'm saying? Because that dynamic has grace within it to unlock that person into every spiritual thing that God wants to bring to them. Abraham was unlocked by God, but then he gave Isaac everything he needed. Now, I taught y'all about how Abraham meditated. But Isaac was next level. Isaac went from meditation to daydreaming. Isaac is the first encounter where we see a man who would dream with his eyes open. Different. Why? He received something from out of his father. Let me see if I can find that. And then we'll wrap up. Let me see these comments real quick. Life ain't been the same since I met y'all. Amen. Uh, 
Let me not got all dang connections. Yo, hold on. I'm, I'm gonna find where Abraham blessed Isaac. Abraham blessed Isaac. Genesis 25. Hey, y'all, hold on one second. I'm looking for the scripture. So this is Genesis 25, and we'll start at verse 1. I think I see more sand in there. This is so good. No, there's no more sand. <laughs> I promise you there's no more flipping tonight. Then again, Abraham took a wife and her name was Keturah. And she bare him Zimran and Jokshan and Medan and Midian and Ishbak and Shua. And Jokshan begat Sheba and Dedan and the sons of Dedan were Asherim and Leshishim and Lemumim. And the sons of Midian, Epha and Epher and Hanach and Abada and Elada, all these were the children of Keturah. And Abraham gave all that he had unto Isaac, okay? So as a father, the ability to give unto an individual is what is necessary. So it tells us here in verse five, Abraham gave all that he had unto Isaac. Now, when we go to verse six, it says, but unto the sons of the concubines, which Abraham had, Abraham gave gifts and he sent them away from Isaac, his son, while he yet lived eastward unto the east country. Now, what we have to ask ourselves is, verse 5, he says what? He gave everything he had to him. But we go to verse 6, he says, and then he called the sons of the concubines, and he gave them gifts and all these other things. I thought everything means everything, and I thought all means all. So how is it that Abraham gives everything to Isaac, but yet he still has enough to give gifts and everything to the concubine sons? I'll tell you that everything, when it says that he gives him everything within the measure of a father is a spiritual substance to give you everything necessary so you can fulfill your destiny. Literally, everything to ensure that everything you need is inside of you to fulfill your destiny. That's why the father's blessing was so important. That's why God loved Jacob, but he hated Esau because Esau despised what his birthright was. He didn't understand that within the father is the unlocking power of blessing. That's why your relationship is so wonderful with your father. He, cause you understand. He didn't understand that. That's why God despised him. Yet he loved Jacob. So when it says here that Abraham gave everything to Isaac, that means that of all of his spiritual substance, he gave that to his son of all of his natural substance, he split that out amongst the natural family. Took the sons of Congo, okay, you get gifts, you get this, you get that. But for him, everything spiritual, I put it into him. That's why Isaac was totally different. Isaac would be danger, Isaac was something else. Most people don't know how deep Isaac was. Isaac was something else. But it was by virtue of that Genesis 21 and five where Abraham gave him everything, right? You see that even with Jacob and Ish with uh, Jacob. Then when Jacob deceives and Jacob gets the blessing, when the brother finally realizes what happens, right? Remember, he deceived him. He tricked him, said, hey, we're going to fix this meal. We're going to fix this meal. Hey, fix me the stew. Fix me the, that's what he says. Fix me the savory meat that I love. Fix me the game that I love. And then the mother hears and says, listen, your father's about to bless your brother. Do what I tell you to do. Go get, go with, with the lamb. Go Go get that lamb, put the, put, the, put the clothes on him, make him feel like he was him. Say, listen, you need to make yourself smell in this manner. And then he presents himself before him. He's like, are you sure this is you? Right? But then he blesses him. Let me, let me find that too. Ishmael. Not Ishmael. Esau.
Okay, here we go. It's Genesis 27. And it came to pass that when Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, he called Esau, his eldest son, and said unto him, My son. And he said unto him, Behold, here I am. And he said, Behold, now I am old. I know not the day of my death. Now, therefore, take, I pray thee, thy weapons, thy quiver and thy bow and go out to the field and take some take me some venison and make me savory meat such as I love and bring it to me that I may eat that my soul may bless thee before I die. So he's telling you now that the blessing that I have doesn't just come by virtue of my words. It comes from out of my soul. That's a spiritual blessing. Remember, the soul is intangible. You can't touch it. You can't capture it by the naked eye, yet it exists more truer than the flesh that we have. Remember, we talked about last night, the soul of a man is who he truly is. So he tells you, go fix me this meal. This meal, I will bless you with my soul if you bring me this meal. Right? This gives a better understanding why we call it what? Soul food. Why we're moved in a way, although it's a physical thing, it moves us in a way that we cannot see. This was his soul food. Go get me the food that I love so my soul can be moved to bless you. And Rebecca, and Rebecca heard when Isaac spake to Esau, his son, and Esau went to the field to hunt for venison and bring. And Rebecca spoke to Jacob, her son, saying, Behold, I heard thy father speak unto Esau, thy brother, saying, Bring me venison and make me savory meat, that I may eat and bless thee before the Lord before my death. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice according to that which I command thee. And this is what she tells him. Go get two goats. I'm going to make you the savory food. You're going to bring it to your father. <laughs> And Jacob said to Rebekah's mother, Behold, Esau, my brother's hairy, and I'm a smooth man. My father will feel me. He's going to know I'm a deceiver. And then she said, Listen, just trust me. And now we skip down. She puts the raiment on him, the skin, all of that stuff. And Jacob said unto his father, I am Esau, thy firstborn. I have done according as thou badest me. Arise, I pray thee, sit and eat of my venison, that thy soul may bless thee. And Isaac said unto his son, How is it that thou hast found it so quickly, my son? And he said, Because the Lord thy God brought it to me. And Isaac said unto Jacob, Come near, I pray thee, that I may feel thee, my son, whether thou be my very son Esau or not. And Jacob went near unto Isaac his father, and he felt him, and said, The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. Now you notice he understands that this is your voice, but the hands feel different. And he discerned him not because his hands were hairy and his brother Esau's hands. So he blessed him. And he said, art thou my very son Esau? And he said, I am. And he said, bring it near to me and I will eat of my son's venison that I, that my soul may bless thee. So the first blessing is a general blessing. This next blessing is the blessing that comes from out of his soul. Remember I said the father has to have the capacity to bring something from out of himself to get into you so that you can receive everything you need to continue the generations. Remember the secret things, the blessings. So all that has to be able to come from out of the father. And he said, bring it to me that I may eat my son's venison that my soul may bless thee. And he brought it near to him and he did eat and he brought near and he brought him wine and he drank. And his father Isaac said to him, come near now and kiss me, my son. And he came near and kissed him, and he smelled the smell of his raiment and blessed him and said, See, the smell of my son is as the smell of a field which the Lord hath blessed. Therefore, God give thee the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth and plenty of corn and wine. Let people serve thee and nations bow down to thee. Be Lord over thy brethren and let my mother's sons bow down to thee. Curse be everyone that curseth thee and blessed be he that blesseth thee. And it came to pass, as soon as Isaac had made an end of blessing Jacob, and Jacob was yet scarce gone out from the presence of Isaac, his father, that Esau, his brother, came in from hunting. And he also had savory meat and brought it unto his father and said unto his father, Let my father arise and bless and eat my venison that thy soul may bless thee. And Isaac, his father, said unto him, Who art thou? And he said, I am thy firstborn Esau. And Isaac trembled very exceedingly and said, Who? Where is it that he had taken venison and brought it to me? And I have eaten of all before thou camest and have blessed him. Yea, and he shall be blessed. He's telling you that, hey, this is settled. 
And when Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with a great and exceeding bitter cry and said unto his father, Bless me, even me also, O my father. And he said, Thy brother came with subtlety and hath taken away thy blessing. And he said, Is not he rightly named Jacob? For he hath supplanted me two times. He took away my birthright, and behold, now he has taken away my blessing. And he said, Hast thou not reserved a blessing for me? And Isaac answered and said unto Esau, Behold, I have made him Lord, and all his brethren I have given to him for servants. And with corn and wine I have sustained him. What shall I do now unto thee, my son? And Esau said unto his father, Hast thou but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. And Isaac his father answered and said to him, Behold, thy dwelling shall be fatness and the dew from the heaven of earth. And by the sword thou shalt live and serve thy brother. And it shall come to pass that thou shalt have dominion and thou shalt break the yoke from off his neck. And Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing wherewith his father blessed him. Literally, he gave all of his spiritual nature unto Jacob. That's what he said. Do you not have anything left in you that you can give me? He says, your brother already has it. The father has to have the ability to take from in himself to give unto his generations. That's why he said, your brother shall be your servants. This is how this will go forth on. It has to be with inside of them. It's not just a cliche church relationship. It's not that. It's a life upon life relationship because God is interested in generations. The God of your father, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, right? Even when you look at Joseph, Joseph became the father, although he was the brother. Why? They all would have to look unto him. Every last one of them would have to look upon him. Why? Because of what God put inside of him. So God puts something inside of other men, but it takes eyes of the spirit to see what does this person have for me? Am I willing to bring myself under in the process? Most people are not because why? It requires you to lose your strength. Most of us want to manifest and show out, look how strong I am. Look how gifted I am. Look what I can do, right? And that's not God's way of doing things. God's way is that if a man will bring himself under, there will be another man that can make your floor your ceiling. And you can literally ascend into heights that you would never reach on your own. If Elisha doesn't follow Elijah, Elijah never gets to go across the Jordan. If Joshua doesn't serve Moses, Joshua never takes the children across the Jordan. You see? Joshua had the same spiritual nature inside of him that Moses has. That's why Joshua was able to take the children back across another body of water. None of them could, Joshua was the only one who could take them across a body of water. Nobody else had the grace to stand in the middle of a body of water and cause the waters to part except for the prophets. And he got that from his father Moses. But there was plenty of other people around. Joshua wasn't even anointed in the 70s. You would think Joshua was, hey man, come on, let him get a little piece of that. No, God had even greater for Joshua. But a spiritual father understands when is the time to give it unto him. Moses understood that now is not the time. But when the time had come, Joshua went on to be greater. So the ability to see the life of another man, the ability even for you as you raise people up to see what does God have for this person and how does my life play a part in that, helping them matriculate to that part. They're at A, God has for them to be at Z. What do I have in me that could get them there? You understand? And that takes a man walking with God. Fathers, I write to you, you who have known him from the beginning. If you haven't known him from the beginning, you can never be a father. You could be a little child. You could be a young man, but you can never be a father if you don't know the one who was from the beginning. Why? Because he is the father. If you know him, you can be like him. You understand what I'm saying? But you have to loose yourself from your traumas. You got to loose yourself from the religious bondage of just having religious cliche names. It's not a church relationship. It's a life relationship. That life relationship will cause a man to take what's inside of him and give it to you so that you can ascend into everything God has for you. And the purpose is that you would excel well beyond him. If you be honest, most spiritual father relationships, they don't dare want to see you exceed them. That's why they won't ever give into you and to you in that way. Because if you exceed them, you take away from them. My joy is that my children should thrive well beyond me. I tell my children, listen, don't leave me behind because my plan is for you to excel beyond me. You better bring me alongside with you. Don't leave me behind. But my plan 
And my vision is that you would excel so far beyond me that I can't even comprehend. I'm like, what is that? How much? What is this? Bring me alongside. I plan on being so slow because they're so far ahead. They're going to have to bring me alongside like for dummies. Why? Because it's the glory of a father that he would see his children excel in ways that he never did. That was Jesus. Jesus had a little local ministry. If you were to equate the life of Jesus, he would be the equivalent of having a storefront church. Yet these men that he sent out went on to touch nations. You see what I'm saying? They went, well, he's, that's why he could say, hey, don't you know that you're going to do greater works than me? That's the grace of a father, that he would cause you to excel beyond what he has done. Literally, you should do greater works than these. If you receive the blessing of a father, you step into that. But we never get into that because we don't understand the blessing that he puts upon us as a father. So then we get stuck in the shallow realm still trying to have conversation if we believe this or believe that. But the disciples didn't have that issue. They went on to touch Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Yet Jesus was only dealing in Israel. And that was his grace. God called me to the lost sheep of Israel. Yet for them, he said, God's going to do much greater with you. So you have to have vision for a person to say, how much, if you can't look at a person and see them being greater than you, you don't stand a chance. You don't stand a chance. What I tell Sean, your star is going to shine so bright and so high. Don't forget God. Why? I can see him being so much greater. If you come hang out with me, I already know God got something great for you. Because the whole purpose is that every man will be greater than the one that they serve. Elisha, Paul, Peter, James, John, Joshua. I mean, we could just, you could just go, Isaiah, you could just go down the whole line. Jeremiah, Daniel, Isaac, you could just, when you look at the progression of each one of them, they all ascended further than the fathers, every last one of them. But that takes true relationship. You know what I mean? True genuine relationship, not that religious jargon. Hey, I would have been mad. Don't be mad. <laughs> Is it okay if spiritual parents never happen for a person? It's actually true that most people, let me tell you something, most people will never have a spiritual father or a spiritual mother. A spiritual mother, like we were talking about, a spiritual mother and a spiritual father is for the purposes that God has set something aside for you to do so great that you're going to need a measure inside of another man to get you there. Like Isaac, what Abraham do? He blessed Isaac with everything that was in him. Like Isaac then did for Jacob. He blessed Jacob with everything that was in him. Like Jesus did for us. Blessing us with every heavenly blessing that's in Christ Jesus. So it's not that every person will have a spiritual father. If you plan to have a great work for God, you will have a spiritual father or a spiritual mother because God invests his best people into people who are going to work and serve him, not to just sit around in church and do nothing. And I'm not saying that, I'm not saying you're doing nothing, Galima. I'm making a general statement. Should a person seek spiritual parents as they pursue close and proximity with Christ? I think it's 50-50. At times, you can pursue relationships with an individual. And at times, I think you, you perhaps maybe not need to go that route. So I don't want to make a cookie-cutter statement like, hey, every person needs to go looking for a spiritual parent. right? I think that you should look to God. And as you look to God, you will find yourself serving the Father. And God will bring people alongside you. The man who takes interest in what God takes interest in will never have a shortage of his fellowship. If he has his fellowship, God will get him everybody he needs to get what he has to get done. That's my story. God continues to bring people next to me because he knows I need help to get this work done. Focus on working unto him, living him, serving him. You'll have everything you need. Because this is such a delicate topic. It is. And if you go back to the beginning, I said that we take our life's traumas and all those things and we overlay them into the church and God never planned for it to happen that way. So no, it's not for every person to have a spiritual father. However, you have a spiritual father because God is the father of all spirits. So you don't even have to worry about that. Look to your heavenly father. Amen. Well, look, it's been real. I love you. I bless you. And uh, we're not flipping this tonight because I'm tired. And with God's grace, we'll, uh, we'll be back at another time and continue to go and receive all he has for us. I'll talk to you soon.
God help me, what the fuck, yeah Can't do this alone, God help me huh? God help me, can't do this alone God help me, what the fuck, yeah God help me, can't do this alone God help me, what the fuck, yeah God bless me, can't do this alone God bless me, yeah I ain't coming off the mountain till I get my blessing And I don't know where it is, so I watch where I'm stepping And I'm walking with this peace, but it's never aggression Cause once upon a time, had to learn a little lesson Read it, in the holy book, I know the reverend said it You're misunderstood, but if you read it and let it Open up the truth, you would find that it would open up everything inside of you But everybody wants to be put on How you even making all these songs? Why don't you ask what's the cash behind the diamond rings, though? I pay attention, I'm listening to your lingo Who I serve, he got eyes like an ego He see everything I promise you won't get away without anything, girl Yeah, <laughs> but that's a cold heart truth I'm being honest, don't ever think that you know my mood He ordered my steps so I know that I will never lose I'm covered in unseen blood Like I said, I true, you can't see it But it's on me Something different about the kids, something funny Maybe if I switch my jersey, they would love me But what does it matter if he ain't rooting for me? God help me, what the fuck, yeah Can't do this alone, God help me God help me, can't do this alone God help me, what the fuck, yeah God help me, can't do this alone God help me, what the fuck, yeah Bless me, yeah God 
bless me Can't do this alone, God bless me Yeah, I ain't coming off the mountain till I get my blessing And I don't know where it is, so I watch where I'm stepping And I'm walking with this peace, but it's never aggression Cause once upon a time, I had to learn a little lesson Read it, in the holy book, I know the reverend said it You're misunderstood, but if you read it and let it Open up the truth, you would find that it would open up everything inside of you but everybody wants to be put on How you even making all these songs? Like how you get the money, how you get the fame? But why don't you ask what's the catch behind the diamond rings though? I pay attention, I'm listening to your lingo Who I serve, he got eyes like an ego He see everything I promise you won't get away without anything no. Yeah, <laughs> But that's the call I true I'm being honest, don't ever think that you know my moves He ordered my steps so I know that I will never lose I'm covered in unseen blood Like I said, I true, you can't see it But it's on me There's something different about the kids, something funny Maybe if I switch my jersey, they would love me But what does it matter if he ain't rooting for me? God help me What the fuck, yeah Can't do this alone, God help me Everybody wants to be put on